Hi, I'm Jonius, and welcome back to the channel. Pokemon! I think it needs no introduction that I'm a huge fan of the series. Have you noticed the PMD-inspired series I've done during the last five years? Listen, I've loved a ton of franchises throughout my life, regardless of the medium, but Pokemon is the one that stayed with me since I was introduced to it all the way back in 2004. Fire Red for the Game Boy Advance will always hold a special place in my heart, as it was the game that introduced me to the series. Fast forward to now, and we're almost there to Generation 9. NINE GENERATIONS! If most people think that this series should have ended with Gold and Silver, they were kind of right. Gen 2 was supposed to be the finale to the series, but due to its immense popularity, it continued on with more entries. So in preparation for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, the games kicking off the ninth generation of the series, I think it's time to look back on Gen 8 and give my overall thoughts on them. For this video, I'll only be looking at the big three titles that were released from 2019 to 2022. Any spin-offs like Mystery Dungeon DX, New Pokemon Snap, Unite, Cafe Remix, among others won't be included. This sounds disappointing, but I'm doing this for simplicity and to keep this video focused on the main topic. Plus, I haven't finished Pokemon Snap or Cafe Remix to give a full opinion on them, so talking about the spin-off titles wouldn't be fair if I didn't spend enough time with all of them. With that out of the way, the three important games during Generation 8 are Pokemon Sword and Shield along with its two DLCs, the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra, the Gen 4 remakes Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and finally ending this video with Legends Arceus. So without further ado, let's talk about the first topic. And so what that means for Pokemon Sword and Shield is that players will be able to transfer their Pokemon from Pokemon Home only if they appear in the Galar region Pokedex. When news about not having every single Pokemon coded into the game broke loose at E3 2019, people were severely pissed about it. As the National Dex is what gave this series a core identity of catching them all, the lead up to Gen 8's premiere titles was a war zone across the community. There were petitions to revert this change, hate video after hate video back to back, admittedly some funny memes but also genuinely disheartening posts about the possibility of their favorite Pokemon not being in the first mainline console game. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee doesn't count, SHUT UP! It was a mess and I didn't like it either. Not to mention their announcement making this decision didn't make things better. As far as I'm aware, it's the biggest controversy the Pokemon community has ever witnessed and even three years later, its effects are still felt to this day. Despite this, the devs stuck to their guns and fast forward to November, Sword and Shield will release. The game itself? It's alright. It's definitely not one of the best mainline entries Pokemon has to offer, but it's serviceable. I'll start with things I didn't like about the games. Story-wise, it's the weakest one so far and doesn't captivate me in the long run. And even though I was able to finish it, I didn't feel satisfied with how boring most of the story was by the end of it. Some of the characters had either good designs but weren't written well enough for me to care, or vice versa. Compared to previous regions where some of the maps were more flexible in how the game wanted you to go in a specific pattern slash direction, the player's journey across the Galar region is basically a straight line from bottom to top. Sure, some of the parts where Sword and Shield's map has you stay in a section to check it out, but even with that, I still didn't like how it was designed to be where it's taking you in a counterclockwise path, as opposed to the first four gens. As for graphics, I'm not gonna harp on that for too long. Tons of people have already made their concerns on how Sword and Shield look like an N64 game, or how the trees look like shit. And to be honest, they all give better explanations than me. Personally, while it's not the worst game I've seen on the Switch, it's definitely not good looking. I'm happy that Scarlet and Violet's visuals are looking like an improvement in the graphical department. Now, that's not to say that everything about Sword and Shield was bad, as I kinda like the new Dynamax mechanic introduced. And some Pokemon get their own Gigantamax forms like the Kanto and Galar starters, Butterfree, Machamp, Meowth, Gengar, among many others. It might not be as good as Z-Moves or Mega Evolution, plus when used, it's only active for the next three turns before the Pokemon goes back to their original form, but I welcome this new style of gameplay. The Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra DLC have a better story than the base game. The new zones for each section were way better than the wild areas in the base game, and while the graphics weren't the best, the layouts were more complex with decent scenery to accompany it. The raid did in the Crown Tundra was also fun. It's a place where you or a party of other players with an online subscription of course, can take on these Dynamax Pokemon. Each battle ends with either your team knocking the boss down and potentially catching it, or until your Pokemon faints too many times and your party gets kicked out. This puts a level of strategy on what everyone's role is, like what Pokemon can they bring, which player should use the Dynamax option because it rotates between everyone, etc. It's a good minigame you can try if you want to catch Pokemon with good or near perfect IVs, or just to farm EXP candies. Yes, there's raid areas in the overworld, but the one in the Crown Tundra is the best one for farming and just to have fun overall. Also, there's one aspect of Pokemon games that has stayed consistently good throughout the run, it's the music. The soundtrack is amazing. It brings more of a techno vibe, but for the game's weak story that has taken place in a region where battling is the heart of it all, especially since the Elite Four is replaced with a tournament league this time around, I think it works fine in this game. 
Lastly, the most important aspect of any new Pokemon game is the mods themselves. Generation 8 in total adds 89 new species and most if not all of them have really good designs. I love the variety they all bring to give the Galar region some form of life in the areas they inhabit. Just like Sun and Moon with Alolan forms given to several Generation 1 Pokemon, Gen 8 brings its own set of regional forms too and I think they all look good. With Farfetch'd, Obstagoon, Mr. Rhyme, Perserker, Persola, and Runerigus being new evolutions completely all have distinct designs and match well with the England inspired region. Out of all of the new Galarian evolutions, Surfetch'd is my favorite. I will simp for this duck like a tier 3 Pokemon sub on Twitch. I love him and I stand Furfetch Supremacy! Overall, Pokemon Sword and Shield have their pros and cons. I don't think Generation 8 had a good start with these games, but it's far from being the worst in the franchise. The new Pokemon roster, Dynamax and Gigantamax mechanics, the Galarian forms and evolutions, as well as the two DLCs were additions I approve of. The music is fantastic as always, Chrychester Town, Leon's Battle Theme, both variations of the Gym Battle Theme, as well as the Battle Tower music made by Sans Undertale's godfather Toby Fox, are just some of the music I really enjoy and occasionally go back to listen to them on YouTube. However, the base story, graphics, and map pattern of the Galar region itself felt undercooked. Three years to make a mainline Pokemon game, especially for a new console, doesn't feel fair. And if Game Freak were given more time to polish the game rather than being stuck to the one new entry every three years mindset, then I think Sword and Shield would have been really good games, but as it stands, it's an okay experience. So Diamond and Pearl are one of the best Pokemon games ever made. I hold Gen 4 and 5 in high regard for how enjoyable they were for their time, so naturally I loved BDSP. The only issue I have with the games is the fact that the Sinnoh region's map layout isn't designed for full 3D movement. In the original, it was plausible due to the Nintendo DS's D-pad only having up, down, left, and right to move in. Because of this, navigating around the region didn't cause me to bump into rocks, trees, or even NPCs that often. In BDSP, you can move in any direction, even diagonally. And Ilka, the developers that Game Freak outsourced this game to, didn't modify or make the map slightly larger to accommodate the 3D movement. So in some cases, although thank fucking god this is rare to encounter, you can literally softlock your game and be stuck in a certain spot because of the map size going by 2006 standards. If it was like Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, where the map was modified to make the 3D movement feel better to run around without halting the momentum, then BDSP's map would have been fine and it wouldn't feel like a faithful recreation of the original. Speaking of which, this game is a bit too faithful to Diamond and Pearl. Other than the graphics, the Grand Underground being different, and Romanus Park replacing the Pal Park in the post game, this is pretty much Diamond and Pearl with a little bit of new content and better graphics. If the remakes never existed and Nintendo released a DS expansion for the Switch Online that included Gen 4, you're not missing out on a whole lot. Since most of the game is as faithful as it can be to the originals, I enjoy this game. Graphics wise, I dig the chibi art style that Ilka used. I know most people hated the game's looks, but I personally think it's fine. If anything, it reminds me a lot of the Link's Awakening remake we got a few years ago. It may not be as good looking as that game, but BDSP does it well and I have no issues with it. In terms of the story, it's the Pokemon traditional plot. Get 8 gym badges, fight our rival Barry who shouldn't even try to win against us because it's not possible for him. Stop Cyrus and Team Galactic from impending doom, beat the Elite Four, defeat Cynthia, become the champion. It's the same story as the original. It was good back then and it's still good now. Not much to say about it. The gameplay is also the same turn-based RPG battle style that we all know and love. All the important trainers Pokemon levels are just as strong as before. I'm looking at you Garchomp. And unless you're under leveled, you'll be fine against most trainers. HMs are these items that were required to gain access to most areas in generations 1 through 6. And each one would take up one of your 4 move slots for any party member. They were such a pain in the ass to manage, and most people would just catch wild Pokemon for the sole purpose of becoming HM slaves. Since Generation 7, these inconveniences were Thanos snapped from existence. And now in BDSP, you can summon random Pokemon that aren't in your party to go to places, like a Staraptor to fly, a Babero to surf the seven seas, etc. It's a good change and I'm really glad they kept this mindset for the new entries moving forward. Now the Grand Underground was something I've never put that much time into the original, but from what I played in the remake, it's alright. Upon entering, you run around mining for ores and treasures in certain spots that can be dug up, after which you can use the stuff you mine to create your own base to place statues in. These statues are used to increase the chance of finding specific types of Pokemon in these new areas called Pokemon Hideaways. There are different biomes in each area of the underground, and you can find wild Pokemon throughout your trip. Many of them are exclusive to this feature, and more Pokemon appear at various points in your progression. With this being the main attraction of the Grand Underground, it makes it easier to complete the Sinnoh Pokedex than before. While I'm not much of a completionist myself, for those who are, I'm happy for them. 
Another major addition to BDSP is the replacement of Pal Park in exchange for Ramanus Park. It's a place found on Route 221 after beating the main story and completing the Sinnoh Pokedex, where you can catch several legendary Pokemon depending on whether you're playing Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl. Except for Giratina in his origin form, who you can only battle against Ew. In order to even catch these legendaries, you need slates, and they're unlocked through a shop in the park that sells them in exchange for mystery shards. These shards are found only by digging in the Grand Underground, and the slates are unlocked in order requiring you to complete the other rooms. I love that each legendary Pokemon has its own unique room to complement its designs, characters, and presence as a powerful entity. For instance, Ho-Oh's room is themed to emulate being at the top of a mountain during sunset, having a beautiful orange color palette. Giratina's room is the distortion world from Platinum version, and it still gives the uneasy vibes capturing the feeling that you are not in the real world. Even the rooms for the legendary birds and dogs give the impressions of being threatening despite being less detailed than the other rooms. It adds more flavor to visiting Ramanus Park and makes the hunt for these guys more enjoyable. Other minor things I didn't touch on are Pokemon following you, really stoked that they brought it back even though they are slow as shit and the size difference was inconsistent. Customizing your Pokemon's ball with stickers so whenever you send them out in battle it flashes with various effects to give your party more personality. I didn't use it that often but I'm glad they brought the feature back. The remaster soundtrack captures the magic that the original music had back then and it's really good. And just like the Gen 2 or Gen 3 remakes, in the post game you can get an item that lets you switch between the original or remastered OST, so if you hate the songs in the remake you can always change change it back. Overall, BDSP was a great experience. Aside from the center region's map looking a bit cramped in most areas, it doesn't accommodate the 3D movement you can have. Everything else stayed faithful as Diamond and Pearl, and the new stuff they added makes this even better for me. It may not be as good as Platinum version, but I say it's better than the original releases. If you never played Gen 4 in the past, then Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl is currently the best way to play this area of Pokemon without using emulation. Legends Arceus Definitely the most experimental Pokemon game released in the Gen 8 era. When I first booted up this game for the first time, I knew something magical was waiting for me and tons of other players. From the moment you get transported back hundreds of years to the past by Arceus, the game lets you know, this isn't your average Pokemon adventure. In this era of Sinnoh, it's not even called Sinnoh. During this time period, humans and Pokemon don't coexist with each other. All you have are the clothes on your back and an arc phone bestowed upon you by Arceus himself, who requests the player to seek out all Pokemon. And by all Pokemon, Game Freak means only 242 of them because the national dex controversy is still in effect. Oops. Upon being woken up by Professor Laverton at Prelude Beach, as well as doing a small tutorial on how to catch Pokemon, we'll get into that later, I promise. The duo head on over to Jubilee Village where they meet their rival, I guess you could call it. Depending on which gender the player is, it could be either Akari or Rei. The player also meets Captain Silene of the Survey Corps Division. You see, there are three members of the Galaxy Expedition Team, an organization consisting of people from all corners of the world who travel to the Hisui region to study its lands and the Pokemon who inhabit them. In basic terms, the earliest form of Pokemon researchers and professors. After Silene accepts Professor Laverton's request to let the player join the organization, offering them a place to stay and food in exchange for hard labor, she instructs the player to pass a trial to prove themselves that they're not dead weight. Laverton gives the player one of the starter Pokemon they caught earlier, and you go do an extended tutorial on the basics of Legends Arceus' gameplay, catching lots and lots of wild Pokemon till the cows come home. So the player passes the trial of catching a Bidoof, a Starly, and a Shinx, and they're formally accepted into the Survey Corps, where they are given the mission of completing the Pokedex. I won't spoil any more of the plot beyond this point, but I'll let you know that the story in this game is great. It adds more backstory and lore to the Sinnoh region's already amazing country in terms of locations that will become memorable landmarks, to even characters being ancestors to people you'll meet in various Pokemon games. And some important characters are drastically different compared to their respective descendants. Characters like Silene and Arezu are good people while still having characteristics to their descendants, while Cyrus and Mars respectively are evil in the present era. You even have some of them who are ancestors to characters from Pokemon titles like Benny, Pacel, Garrick, and Clay. Not everyone I mentioned by name is a part of the Galaxy expedition team, but Legends Arceus has a diverse cast of people from everywhere in the Hisui region. The more people you meet, the more this time period feels great to be in, even though you were sent here by God and have no way of getting back home. The gameplay is another ambitious aspect of Legends Arceus and it feels completely different than before. The end goal is to complete the Pokedex and since you are now a member of the Survey Corps, you're mostly going to catch tons of wild Pokemon. Whether it's by throwing your Pokeball from a distance like it's an MLG montage or going full Metal Gear Solid and catching them stealthily. 
You can also find or craft items to help you increase your catch rate such as berries, stealth sprays that are smoke bombs to muffle your steps, and stun items among many others. Crafting is also a big part of your survey expeditions. The stuff you collect can be found out in the wild or purchased at shops and can be useful when the situation calls for it. But this series is refreshing to do in a way more interesting way than just running into tall grass, battling them to reduce their HP, and then throwing a ball at them. Don't get me wrong, that method is also in the game, but the fact that the new option to catching Pokemon is also here gives the player more options on completing the decks, and I think it's neat. When you finish each trip in one of the 5 open areas, you report back to Laventon for your results. Depending on how many Pokemon you've caught, you're rewarded with money and experience points to climb the ranks. The ranks range from 1 to 10, and the higher one you have, the more crafting recipes and items you unlock. I've only reached rank 9 before I put down the game back when it first came out, but even by that time I was able to get tons of useful items to help me with my task. Of course, no Pokemon game would feel like Pokemon if it wasn't for the battles themselves. This time around, the battle system still keeps the same turn-based format the series always had, but they included a new mechanic that determines how many turns your Pokemon can have depending on their speed stat. If a Pokemon is knocked out, the action speed modifier will carry over to the next one, and they'll attack you straight away. On top of that, each of your four abilities have two styles to change the order of who goes first. The strong style increases your move's power, but your speed will be lowered and you'll take fewer turns. Meanwhile, the Agile style raises your speed, which will make your next turn come sooner or grant you 2 or 3 turns in a row if your Pokemon's speed stat is really good, but it lowers your move's damage output. This encourages you to think of a strategy on how to execute it with the number of turns you have. Do you value your strength and try to defeat the enemy's Pokemon in less than 2 turns, or do you value them dearly to try to get more turns to set up status effects and chain multiple attacks in succession? It's such a breath of fresh air to see how each battle is shown near the end of the game, and some of the trainer's battles get nail-bitingly tense. Speaking of trainer battles, they don't happen as often as usual. Most of your fights come from either wild or noble Pokemon. Nobles are guardians of each section of the Hisui region, and are descendants of 5 of the 10 companions of the ancient hero of legend. At some point in the story, these nobles became hostile due to a special energy from the space-time rift you fell out of at the start. To calm them, the player must throw bombs made of their favorite food while avoiding any oncoming attacks they throw at you until this frenzy gauge reaches zero. After being quelled, each noble Pokemon will grant the player the plate corresponding to its type. Plus, you can rematch them in the postgame with higher and full effort levels. What's interesting about these boss fights is that there'll be moments where they're temporarily stunned, and you have the chance to use your Pokemon to battle them. But if you want to make it more challenging, you can defeat all five of these nobles with just bombs alone. That's right, you can go full on Dark Souls on these guys and assert your dominance like the Giga Chad you are. So even though these trainer battles don't happen as much, the game still makes the battle system more engaging and requires the player to be more strategic in how they approach in every situation. I absolutely adore this change and I would love to see this return in Gen 9. Lastly, for transportation, there are 5 Pokemon mounts you can obtain throughout the course of the story, and each one has a unique way of navigating across the region. You have Weirder who can run across much faster, Ursaluna to dig up for treasures and some of those items can be sold at shops for a high price. Basculegion can help you traverse any ocean river or lake without drowning, Sneasler can climb up any mountains or steep cliff, and finally you have Braviary to fly across any section of the region although you can't steer him up or down as he slowly glides down once he shoots up in the air. All the mounts work really well and it makes backtracking or exploring new places much easier once you unlock each of them one by one. Pokemon Legends Arceus, in my honest opinion, one of the best games in recent memory. The story and gameplay were two of the most important and ambitious parts of this section of the video. I love how Game Freak was able to make a good narrative with characters being connected to those we meet in the future, and being able to add more flavor to the repetitive gameplay the series has been using since Gen 1. Sure, it may not be innovative by gaming standards, as plenty of series like Final Fantasy X have these mechanics long before Pokemon, but for this franchise alone, it's a nice change of pace, and I thoroughly enjoyed every second of it. My only issue with the game is just graphics. Look, I'm not much of a graphics whore. Do I want a Pokemon game that looks as good as Breath of the Wild or Xenoblade Chronicles 3? Yes! But with what we got, I don't think it's the end of the world that we got an okay looking game with fun gameplay. As long as the game I'm playing doesn't look like an MS-DOS game from the 70s, then I'm fine with my product. Aside from that, the game has a good soundtrack with moods changing from ominous to dramatic, along with peaceful tracks when doing expeditions. Music doesn't play that often in the wild, but when it does, it eases you into the region and gives you a moment to take that feeling in. You are out there minding your own business with no sounds other than the ambience and the wild Pokemon around you. Then suddenly, a track like Obsidian Firelands, Heartwood Forest, Alabaster Icelands, and so many more that play throughout your adventure begins to immerse you into this world. It's just amazing to play around. So if you want a fresh take on the series while still feeling like you're playing a Pokemon game, then Legends Arceus is something I recommend to at least give a shot. It's not a masterpiece, but it's a step in the right direction, and the ingredients for future installments make their debut here. While Generation 8 has the rockiest start to a Pokemon era with Sword and Shield, it did get a satisfying ending with Legends Arceus. I'm not saying that Arceus' DLC was bad, I just think that the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra was a little more enjoyable for me. 
Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl has the best graphically looking game. Seriously, I love the GB art style, even if most people despise it. And finally, Legends Arceus has the best main story and gameplay mechanics, which isn't saying much when the other two gameplays is just standard Pokemon stuff. Along with spinoffs like Unite, Pokemon Snap, Cafe Remix, and Mystery Dungeon, my favorite spinoff series came back to celebrate its 15th anniversary after a 7 year hiatus was pure bliss. Gen 8 was overall a decent era for the franchise. The National Dex controversy before Sword and Shield's release really put a bad taste in everyone's mouth, so I hope that Scarlet and Violet will be a fantastic start to Generation 9. So that's pretty much everything I have to say for Pokemon's 8th generation. So Surfitch, ready to embark on a new adventure with me? <laughs> no, no, wait, 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 w